Hello, this is Philip Myers of PEMI Consulting. Welcome to part 10 on pressure vessels. We are at a point where we can now talk about the behavior of pressurized equipment such as pressure vessels, piping, and tanks under the action of stresses caused by internal pressure. We won't go into much detail, but the concept should help you understand how the codes and standards use these ideas to establish required wall thicknesses for pressurized equipment. We'll confine our discussion of pressure vessels to cylindrical and spherical vessels. Cylindrical vessels are by far the most common. We won't be talking about the closure or heads on the vessels, which can be dished and flanged, elliptical, hemispherical, or even flat. That involves engineering mechanics beyond the scope of what we are doing here. For our purposes, the assumption is a material like steel is isotropic, meaning that its properties are the same no matter what the direction you're considering. It turns out that's an excellent assumption. We also confine our discussion to internal pressure and omit a discussion of vacuum effects on these, this equipment. If the stresses are within the elastic range, then we can develop a very useful hoop stress formula as well as how to figure out the axial stresses. Knowing how to compute hoop stresses is very useful because all of the ASME and API codes are based on this stress when determining the shell thicknesses for the cylindrical portion of the containers. In the case of pressure vessels, the stresses are biaxial since the pressure applies force both in the circumferential direction as well as the axial direction, but more on that later. If we make one more assumption that the wall thickness is less than a tenth of the radius, then the stresses throughout the wall can be considered uniform as shown. So the actual stress profile it looks like this, but for thin wall vessels where we meet this condition of the last bullet, uniform stresses can be considered appropriate. As you might guess, spheres are the most efficient storage in terms of the amount of steel required to contain a given pressure at a given diameter, but they are harder to construct because fabricating them involves compound curvature, which means there are two directions of curvature. The cylinder, on the other hand, can be rolled and curved on a simple rolling machine. As proof, you can take a sheet of paper and easily roll it into a cylinder, but try to make a sphere from another sheet of paper. See what I mean? The simplest and easy, what, easiest way to derive the classic hoop stress formula is based on two key ideas. The first one is Pascal's law that states that pressure behaves isotropically. That is, the pressure always acts equally in all directions at a point. From this, you can conclude that the pressure always acts normally or perpendicular to any surface that contains the fluid or the liquid. The second key idea is the free body diagram, which allows us to make imaginary cuts through the vessel any way we like, as long as we observe the basic principles of force equilibrium. In the top diagram, consider a long cylindrical vessel with pressure on the inside. Note the biaxial stress condition. This is the axial direction, indicated by sigma 2. The hoop direction or circumferential direction is the stress indicated by sigma 1. So the hoop stress is sigma 1, the axial stress is sigma 2. The hoop stress formula is fairly easy to derive. We simply balance the force in the steel where we've taken a free body diagram cut plane through the diameter of the cylinder and this force has to balance the pressure force acting on the imaginary cut plane. So force is stress times area. So on the left hand side of the equation we have 2 because there is a top and bottom surface. 2 times T times B. So the wall thickness times the length that gives the area times sigma 1 which is a stress. That balances the pressure acting on this rectangular surface indicated by the black arrow and that's B, the area is B times 2R and then times the pressure. So we can cancel things out and we get the famous hoop stress formula PR over T. And we've summarized it here. The axial stress is just about as simple to derive. We balance the pressure force indicated by the black arrow, that's just the area times the pressure. P2 is equal to the pressure times pi r squared and 
that is equal to the force in the steel container across this section and that's sigma 2 times the circumference 2 pi r times the thickness. Because we've made the thin wall pressure vessel assumption these approximations to the actual area are sufficiently good. After cancellation we get sigma 2 is equal to PR over 2T summarized again here. Notice the important point that the axial stress is only half of the hoop stress. The spherical pressure vessel also has a biaxial stress condition. Consider this stress element. It's the same no matter where this element is located, so direction becomes irrelevant for the stress element. The stresses are the same in all directions by symmetry. Use the same idea to derive the stress formula, but this time we call it a membrane stress instead of a hoop stress because there is no hoop direction. So we balance the forces in the cut plane through that pass through the center of the sphere. This is uh, sigma times the circumference 2 pi r times t, the thickness. That force is balanced against the pressure force p, which is the pressure, times pi r squared. So we can do the same thing, cancel things, and end up with the membrane stress formula for a sphere. It's sigma equals PR over 2T. Note the interesting fact that the membrane stress is exactly the same as the axial stress for a given diameter and pressure. That means that for a given diameter and pressure, you would use half as much steel wall thickness as you would for a cylindrical vessel. Stresses in vertical cylindrical, cylindrical tanks are a little different. First note that there's a triangular pressure profile. It starts at zero at the liquid surface and goes to a maximum at the bottom. But what happens at the bottom is that the bottom is restrained, so it can't expand. It has no hoop forces because the bottom is restrained. So what we do is go up one foot from the bottom and take the pressure one foot off of the bottom and that is what determines the wall thickness by the hoop stress formula. So it's as simple as that. So we've learned that most pressure vessels are cylindrical and hoop stress governs thickness. Most pipe is cylindrical and hoop stress also governs thickness. Spherical vessels are rare compared to cylindrical because they're harder to build, but they're more efficient in terms of the amount of steel that must be used to store a given volume. Cylindrical vessel stress formulas are given here. PR over T for the hoop stress and one half of that amount for the axial stress. For spheres, the membrane stress is PR over 2T. It's the same formula as you would get for the axial stress in a cylinder. Next time, we'll delve further into more circle to understand how shear stresses behave in this equipment. Since ductile materials often fail by excessive shearing stresses, it's useful to have an understanding of what is called the 3D Morse circle. Thank you.